Well, we're here at the finale. I hope everyone watching has enjoyed our journey in trying to understand the lore of Inscription, but now it's time to get serious. This is the entire lore of Inscription Act 3. As a reminder, the dredger placed PO3 into power after fishing out the old data from Inscription's files, thus giving him full control of the game. PO3 asks us to defeat four uberbots to allow for an event he calls the Great Transcendence. We also appear to be strapped to the table of the game itself. The game is quite different from what we're used to. PO3 even gloats about having more lanes than less she had. Whilst the first two games mostly required sacrificing, this game requires a lot more patience. With every turn you get an additional energy point to use. You only hold one energy at the start of each round, but it will go up from that point on. Your primary defense is the Empty Vessel, which acts as a blockade and has two health. Generally, your stronger cards will have higher energy costs. There are a few new sigils in Act 3. One of them will allow you to target which lane you wish to shoot, whilst another will self-destruct upon being destroyed. PO3 has far less charisma, storytelling ability, and compassion to guide you through the process. Even when you encounter the opportunity to add a card to your deck, there isn't any excitement or explanation as to the bot's abilities. It's at this point that many players of the game will miss Leshy, and if you're like most players of the game, you probably chose to replace him during Act 2. We randomly get an item that allows us to charge our energy in one turn. No lead up, just PO3 informing us that Bottopia has overpowered items lying about. Even modifying our abilities has lost its excitement, without the immersive stone tablets requiring a sacrifice from one of our cards. A lot of things in this game are just given to us. We access a waypoint allowing us to replenish our items and fast travel. Now what's interesting is occasionally you'll find shortcuts or secret areas in the game. By hovering the cursor over random points of the map, you may find an arrow allowing you to access these areas. The first hidden area allowed me to obtain a pelt, although for what purpose these pelts are used for, we have yet to find out. Hey look, there's Rebecca again. She needs time to build the bridge on the western side of Bottopia, so we have to go eastwards. Another system we're introduced to is the Bounty system. We can obtain a maximum of 3 stars if we start winning enough battles, which will attract bounty hunters. These are much more powerful opponents who are introduced into battle, and get more difficult to defeat the higher the star. Our first bounty hunter is Moon Wilkinson, who is a very generic representation of a character. We can defeat him and he simply runs away. I've also neglected the use of the hammer, which if you remember was stuck to the wall during Act 1. This hammer will allow us to purposefully break our cards, replacing the sacrifice function of allowing space on the board. Right as we get to the next waypoint, the battery on PO3's device runs out. He allows us to get up just for an instance in order to get a new battery. We're allowed to go to the inspection room, but we can also choose to look around. Leshy's clock appears in the factory, which PO3 notes as a glitch. It is interesting how regardless if a scribe is put into power, there will still be occasional recurrences of the other scribe's game mechanics. Unlocking the clock by changing the time to 4 will give us a very powerful Ourobot, which we've grown from Act 1 and Act 2. Messing around with time again, we get a very weird symbol, a sigil with two dots and lines on it. We can't do anything else with it at the moment. We can also find two puzzles that will give us some very useful items. The first item is Mrs. Bomb's remote, allowing us to put explode bots on all empty spaces of the board effectively wiping it. By solving the next puzzle using Magnificus's mechanics, we can finally free Lonely Wizbot, who is excited by his stimulation. His sigil is quite useful, moving his lane positioning next to the bot closest to him. We solve some puzzles and get a battery. Should we choose to, we can also get Fish Bot. Our good old angler friend has the ability of giving us one of three fish cards each time he perishes in battle each with varying abilities. We decide to go to the bottom right of the map, which is clearly a resurgence of Grimora's area. 
We even see potential cards similar to her way of playing. The Skelelatcha is an incredibly useful card which, once perishing, can put the Brittle Sigil on whatever card it chooses, effectively killing that card once it attacks. We also find a new encounter allowing us to overclock a card. This will make the card powerful at the cost of risking its permanent loss if it perishes in battle. It's here we can meet Casey, represented as the ghoul from Grimora's area. Casey offers to melt the ice using heat, to which PO3 gives a laugh. A very interesting reaction. An encounter appears where we choose to obtain a card by trading one of our own. Another indicator that PO3 does not like being too generous. In another battle, Fishbot mentions that the other scribes, including Leshy, are nearby. He also mentions Deep Beneath, a phrase which we had previously heard during Act 1. We reach the next waypoint and can enter Grimora's Crypt, which PO3 kindly names Filthy Corpse World. I decide to overclock my shield bot, which by the way manages to stay alive throughout the entire playthrough. Here's where things get interesting. From the blue key we unlocked in Act 2, we can access this area and find the Bone Lord. He states he will give us the secrets of the old data, but we aren't allowed to record them. So Luke turns off his camera. What the fuck, man? One can only wonder what PO3 and Luke heard. We can find another pelt by accessing this area. We go through the well and obtain a quill. Moving forward into the last area, we sign an agreement presented by two strange figures and are allowed to move forward. Now it's here we fight our first boss, the Archivist. Trying not to panic, I set down all my cards and manage to beat the boss within one turn. If you do end up getting the fire loss, you get a pretty funny message. After every boss, we can also upgrade our vessels. I choose the sharp quills, meaning any enemy that attacks our vessel will get one damage dealt in return. Luke's memory card becomes full and so we are given access once more to all his saved videos. The first video shows Luke in his car after buying full vintage card packs of inscription at a garage sale. So hunting days have finally paid off. Yeah. Yeah, baby. What do you guys see this? You know what that is? You know what that is? Vintage packs of inscription. Luke then decides to call a number, supposedly from the number of where the garage sale was advertised. He then refers to the caller as Miss Hobbs. We might finally understand who Casey Hobbs is. Turns out Miss Hobbs is the mother of Casey Hobbs. We learn that Casey worked for Game Funa, which means she would have also been a part of Inscription's development. Unfortunately, Casey died a while ago. In the next video, Luke is looking through some news articles where he learns about a facility which was set on fire. Casey ended up dying in the fire as a result of fire-related complications, which makes this encounter with PO3 pretty damn funny. The next video contains mostly clues for the ARG. In this video, someone seems to be in Luke's house. He records the incident as evidence in case anything happens to him. My phone's in the other room, so if I die before I can call 911, I use this tape as evidence.
and in the next two videos we see mostly errors except for a code. The second error however is quite disturbing with Luke playing with the inscription scales before laughing maniacally. Back to the game we move north. PO3 claims this is the last area of Botopia which still has life in it. We encounter a unique fight sequence involving a generator. Our goal is to recharge it by getting enough points to attack. We only have a few turns to do this before it's game over. Now there are opposing stations which have the annoy sigil giving the opposing side an extra attack point. I use this to get as many points as I can and win. Now after the archivist boss fight where Luke gives access to his hard drive, we can actually find files from his computer. These are log entries which give us a glimpse into Luke's life. Luke and his sister were quite close. They had both been avid fans of card games and other similar activities. In the logs we see a card which Luke had managed to collect from a card game he and his sister played. Luke and his sister also won a tournament at Comics Land. She tragically died later on although we don't find out how. This is the last photo he took with her. We learn that Luke started his YouTube channel in order to deal with his grief. After obtaining 100 subscribers, he was then motivated to continue making videos. Continuing on, we move through the forest. Unlike the other areas which appear sterile and cold, this part of the map fills the room with a warm glow. We also encounter this very interesting character named Zip Van Maxim, who tells us his life goals before we promptly destroy him. We once again encounter the Prospector, who opens up a shortcut for us by mining some gold. We can then get access to Beast's Alter Egos, a card ability which will gain characteristics from one of three cards from Act 1 after one turn. PO3 then mentions Leshy's plays. PO3 judges Leshy's heavy focus on lore and flavour, as well as his misplays. Another pelt is obtained in this area before we reach the next waypoint and enter Leshy's cabin. The next uberbot sits waiting patiently for more challenges. It's here where we fight the photographer who, like the previous counterpart, is based off of a scribe, which I'm sure you can deduce. At the start of our turn, we may take a photo of the table. During our next turn, we can then revert the board back to the photograph we took. It's a pretty fun fight in that you have to decide when is the best time to revert back to a previous position or whether it is better to have all your cards remain the same. We manage to win and further enhance our empty vessels. Going back to the main area, I buy a hollow pelt as well as an item which will put a shield over our cards. I upgrade a few more of my cards and we move on to the western side of Bartopia. Moving to the southern side, we reach what is presumed to be Magnificus's area. PO3 forgets a piece, requiring us to stand up and get it. We can look around and find some floating books and other pieces from previous scribes. We're able to visit the goo who seems to be in a lot less pain due to the pressure surrounding him. We do a few more puzzles, one of which is quite unnerving. We get the piece required but can also find a briefcase where the new game option is locked up. Going back, our empty vessels are now filled with gems. The piece we brought back will allow us to see which gems we have. We can then gemify a card which if we have gems will either increase health with green, increase power with orange and decrease costs with blue. A later encounter with one of Magnificus's students will give us a shortcut. Reaching the next checkpoint, we can activate a signal which will give us access to the north side of Bartopia. PO3 admits that Magnificus was never dull and had a plan for everything. 
except for the Great Transcendence. We get to the next Uber Butt fight where we have to help make the bus ourselves, so we give it a handsome face. We are then asked to make our own rules for the fight through various combinations. I decided to make a rule where every time I play a card, a random card is played. Now this fight does get very chaotic and tricky. I use the bomb detonator to my advantage, but even this is not enough to stop the chaos that ensues. The fight becomes even more difficult so I have to recharge my energy, leaving me only the nano armor. Being allowed to make another rule, I create the rule of every time a card dies, all cards take one damage. After some more chaos, we can make one more rule. I decide to play it risky and choose a rule where when our turn starts, a random card takes 5 damage. We get really close and finally with 1 point left, I win. I make my empty vessels very powerful by giving them the sentry ability, ensuring that any card that appears in front of it will get shot. Upon entering the north area representative of PO3's factory, he claims to feel a sense of pride. Our empty vessels then become conduits, a mechanic which we aren't yet told about. It's here that PO3 challenges us to make our own card. Now, if you were paying attention before, you would have noticed this little image of a robot. Upon being asked to make one ourselves, we can copy the instructions from it. I name my robot and here we get another one of those weird symbols we found in the clock. Going back to the robot that takes photos, we can actually time the flash to see what the other sigil is. In case you didn't know, the dots are indicators of the sigil's positions, which we can use on this combination. The goose states that the painting is his, and he hopes that one day Magnificus will treasure him. The goo becomes self-conscious at first, but after viewing the painting again, he gains the confidence to show it to his master before disappearing. I certainly think that Magnificus has had an impactful personality, especially if he's able to impress not only all his students, but PO3 himself. We can go around this area activating more satellites and also find the dredger, the character responsible for fishing up the old data and putting PO3 into power. He's apparently very happy and proud of the status he's received. We can enter this room with a padlock symbol on it. Clicking it will result in a door inside of the factory opening up. It's here we meet one of the most important lore providers in the game, the trader. The hollow pelts we've collected aren't completely useless as they'll give us an insight into the lore of the game itself. This card is the card of the fool. Right, this is Barry Wilkinson, the guy who in the ARG spread the Carnaval code resulting in him getting killed. This card is the Empress. She discovered a lot of the old data, explaining Lushy's reaction to her.
Now, the triangle doesn't only refer to Game Funa's logo, but it also references the ending of the hex, which allows a gateway into the real world. In the hex, characters are effectively given sentience, which is what Inscription explores as well. It's likely that the old data not only gives power to the scribes, but also allows them to be sentient. The blue man mentioned most likely refers to Irving, who acts as the primary antagonist of the game. The tower pretty much retells the same story of the Empress. The death card is focused on the purpose of the Carnoffel Code. The Carnoffel Code itself may have been made to destroy all life, or even worse. The code is in the cards implies the specific sequence that the Carnoffel cards need to be placed in to reveal what the code is. Finally, we have the Devil card. He created a curse, data that could not be erased. His presence has corrupted the scribes to be more antagonistic towards each other. Now, here are further connections to the first game, Pony Island. In Pony Island, Satan himself tortures souls by creating a game designed to torture them. He understands how to code and program, and at some point, he creates the old data. This old data then somehow comes into the real world. Let's check out the Lucky Carter channel again, shall we? In the video game Funa Takedown Initiated, we see Casey logging into her work account. We see a takedown notice similar to the one sent to Luke. The most interesting part of this is the words written on the bottom right of the screen. Sincerely, Lou Natus, CEO Game Funa. Now what happens if you spell Natus backwards? That's right, you get Satan. And Lou is the first syllable to Lucifer. Is this far-fetched? No. Satan creates a code which he frees out into the world. Lionel, a video game programmer in the Hex, decides to sell his characters and games to Game Funa, who are then corrupted by the code, thus becoming sentient. The triangle is accessed by Lionel, who uses it to communicate to a sentient Irving. It's clear that Satan himself somehow managed to open up a gateway into the real world in order to release the old data. Before we defeat the last boss, you're probably wondering where the purple key we got belongs to, right? Well, here we find another secret area. The mycologist appears in front of us having taken control of PO3. They combine their cards to make them more powerful. I die the first time and they state they need more time to experiment and tell me to return. Now it's time for me to win. Using a bum latcher, I place a self-destruct sigil on the experiment. I take care of the damage using my other cards and ensure that the mycologist doesn't combine anything else. We manage to win before the mycologist gets just the right combination of two cards, the gem detonator and the douse. They create a fragment of the old data before making PO3 forget the entire encounter. Before activating the signal required for the bus, I make one more bot card, which looks pretty good. <laughs> this card is OP! This last uber bot is hardly based on PO3, and appears to represent a more optimistic side to him. The bot's name is Golly, and her gimmick involves using the internet. She summons a mole after looking on the internet, and Lonely Wizbot becomes very excited at the idea of unlimited internet access. Yeah. 
This is when our steam friends will actually act as opposing enemies who will fight us. We then get a mummy lord from the internet. The fight is pretty difficult as I'm overwhelmed by my steam friends but I manage to get through it. We then make a card for someone else but no one is able to receive it so I take it instead. Being overwhelmed I use the bomb detonator which gives me time to get some better cards and win. PO3 notices that the dredging room security camera is broken, so he tells us to inspect it. Now talking to the goo, we learn a bit more about PO3's personality. Golly may in fact be a buried personality of PO3, a personality that is both curious and innocent. This may explain his need to understand the mechanics of all other scribes by implementing the game mechanics into his own game. Sure, Leshy did something similar, but not to the extent of PO3. Just a little moment which I think a lot of people might have missed. We're lowered down into the elevator where we meet the three familiar faces of the scribes. They managed to get along just for a bit in order to stop the Great Transcendence. Their plan is to attack PO3 once he thinks he has won. That way he won't be focused on the security cameras. Grimora proceeds to roast the shit out of PO3's mechanics. Before Leshy offers to kill PO3 himself. PO3 scolds you for not fixing the security cameras before you return to the monuments. PO3 then recalls both of your time together. He even admits in his own little way that he enjoyed our company. He then explains what the great transcendence was, whilst intimidating Luke by activating his webcam. PO3's plan was to upload inscription to the internet and spread copies, where in the majority of games he remains in charge. He proceeds to upload the game before Leshy rips his head off. Magnificus states we can reset the game by using the new game card again. Grimora then uses the ability from the archivist fight to access Luke's hard drive. She deletes inscription, thus dooming every character within the game. She sees this as freedom from the endless fighting for power and the pain that comes from sentience. We say goodbye before we begin falling. We get access to Grimora's Crypt, a familiar site that allows us to see a little bit of what playing with Grimora might have been like. Her dialogue is filled with regret at the fact that she did not get to play alongside you. Her gameplay is certainly quite interesting, but she notes that deep beneath the data of inscription, there is something truly evil. That is, the old data. It really is a shame that we missed out on what could have been an interesting game from Grimora. She has unique rules and an interesting progression style. She tells us to be careful and notes our interest in the Karnoffel code. When we get to the last part of the board, she's excited. She can finally show us what she had planned and brings out a bus fight. Before she can really get into things, the game is slowly destroyed. Cool. 
She's disappointed at the fact that she will never get the chance to play with us again. With an arm extended, we shake her hand before she's permanently deleted. The encounter with Leshy was the most painful. You can see from the expression on his face that he's sitting there, waiting to die. Although we can see in the way he hides part of his face, that he still maintains that same charisma and use of mystery by hiding in the dark. He talks about his excitement when we first found the disc and played against him. It's weird, I now really regret choosing him during Act 2. But Leshy forgives us, and we continue playing cards against each other, with the somber tune of the music in the background. He warns us that there are things on the disc best not seen. Now, it's here where I notice something unique. During my first two playthroughs, I actually beat Leshy during the final interaction. On this run, however, I ended up losing. Leshy, however, still reacts to our loss in a very humble way. Not rubbing it in, but simply wanting to play with you. We continue playing against each other as everything is slowly removed. He extends his arm and we shake his hand before he's deleted. Approaching Magnificus, we see that he's bleached out the goo from the painting he made. It's a small moment in the game that has made me really think about why he chose to do this. Out of spite? Pain? I'm not too sure. He may have been the closest to Magnificus out of all his students. Magnificus asks why we chose to keep playing the game instead of ejecting the disc. Because he is able to see the future, he understands that Luke will keep playing the game. He even briefly hints that Luke as well will end up dying. We put on what's called a dual disc and get ready to battle. Because of the lack of scales, he simply sets a number system. Magnificus questions our intentions and our inability to eject the disc. Our curiosity is what will lead to the destruction of Inscription's world. Before Magnificus can even shake our hand, he too is deleted. The wood carver is all that is left, and she warns us not to access the old data. She then notes that we will not take her advice before she too is deleted. What Luke sees is so horrifying that he destroys the disc with a hammer.
We end on a final video with Luke talking to what I assume to be a journalist. He hears a knock on the door before he's shot by Amanda. For a single frame, we see this, and as Luke's blood drips on the floor, the credits roll. Let's put the last pieces of the puzzle together. Sado is a character from The Hex who causes general chaos amongst the character's games. In the ending of The Hex, a portal is open into the real world, with a single spider dangling from the roof. Prior to that, Sado had transformed herself into a spider after being defeated. Where am I going with this? You can sometimes see a spider who will crawl on the board. I have reason to believe that Sado managed to also infect this game. In the after credit scene of the Hex, we see Sado's face for a brief frame. It is quite likely that she is working together with Satan, or that Satan has control over her. It could also be possible that the single frame implies that Amanda is being controlled by Sado to get rid of Luke. Now, in Casey's mod, getting a certain number of points will allow you to read something quite valuable. Casey's diary. Let's try and interpret her story. I will try and summarize each part of the story, but will briefly place the log on screen, which you are free to read. Log 1. We learn about how Leshy got into power. Unlike what many fan theories suggest, I do not actually think Casey chose for him to get into power. According to the log and in the video, the angler fished up the old data. Casey in her log is very surprised when the angler gets up, especially since no walking animation was created for him. As she congratulates him and the log ends. Log 2. Casey is absolutely astonished as inscription is now 3D. She worries that no one else will listen to her if she were to try and explain the situation. Log 3. Casey considers sharing the development with the rest of her co-workers, but decides against this. She praises the game for actually being fun, and claims that Leshy feels like a friend to her. Log 4. We learn here that Leshy can only speak of the old data when wearing the woodcover's mask. Casey later finds a log from Kaminsky. She claims that the guy had issues, and in one of Kaminsky's logs, claims inscription was a cover. She doesn't know what this means. Log 5. It's here where Casey begins working on her mod to make the game more difficult, as she finds that although the game is fun, it can still break very easily. Log 6. Now, it turns out that the Casey Hobbs ghoul skull was an item intentionally added to the game. The ice, however, may have been added afterwards. Leshy uses the skull to collect any excess teeth for the trapper. Casey finds the collection process tedious and removes this option, which explains why he collects teeth via a bowl instead. Log 7. Casey now learns about the disturbing things hidden within inscription, occasionally getting context from the woodcarver. Her most interesting quote in this log, however, is, There could be a doomsday machine under Berlin, armed by a code hidden in a pack of cards, implying the physical remnants of the Carnoffel code. It belonged to you know who. Here, Casey goes to Comics Land and meets Luke. She describes Luke as a weird dude, and it's possible that this takes place shortly after Luke's sister passed away, due to his interest in recording the game on a camcorder. Here, Casey finds out that the stoat is actually PO3. It seems that this wasn't done on purpose by Leshy, since he looks at it unamused. Casey is unsure where the other scribes might be. Casey, on a walk, considers throwing the disc into the water but stops herself as she realizes that maybe the code can be used to disarm the machine. She also gives us an insight into what the Carnoffel code can do, when she says, Destroy the disc, no one finds the code. No one can blow up half of Europe. Log 11. Part of the log is corrupted, but Casey accepts that no one is going to be able to play her mod or the game itself. She fantasizes about being appreciated for her work before the log ends. In the last log, Kaminsky calls Casey at 9.45pm. She decides the best course of action is to bury the disc with the coordinates written on it. She ends with, Leshy will thank me, the world may not. With this in mind, it's no wonder that Luke immediately becomes a target the moment he mentioned inscription. Inscription is effectively just a cover to keep the Carnoffel code, and its purposes hidden within the game. Why Kaminsky shared the code in the first place, I'm not too sure. Maybe it was because of direct orders. 
Regardless, Casey is soon killed after this, likely for knowing too much. This explains why Leshu shows recognition upon seeing Casey's death card. Now, as to the fate of the game itself, there is something quite disturbing. In one of the ARG solutions, we see that PO3 successfully uploaded an inscription, despite being destroyed. If Daniel Mullins creates some sort of sequel to this, I would really love to see how everything comes together. With that out of the way, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.